These are the sights and sounds of a billion dollar enterprise. And these are the entertainers who turn small time wrestling into very big business. Welcome again to Biography Body Slam Week, our look at some of pro wrestling's most bizarre characters. Tonight, Jesse Ventura, who went from chief villain to chief executive. <gasps> this is the Monster Factory in New Jersey, a place where would-be pro wrestlers learn the art of faking it, sometimes a valuable skill in politics as well. It's been one year since Jesse Ventura stunned America with his election as governor of Minnesota. He continues to make headlines with his freewheeling and sometimes R-rated comments. Ventura claims to care less, though, about polls or popularity. After all, Jesse the Body Ventura spent years as the most despised villain in the world of pro wrestling. Here's a guy with a little bit of pizzazz. Put in the right direction, put on the right path, he would excel. Allowed to go too far the other way, and he'd be the mafia dot. Wrestling to him was a performance art. It was a form of acting, and it was an act that, that uh, he took very seriously and performed very well. He's a lot smarter than people perhaps gave him credit for. This isn't some dumb former pro wrestler. He knows what he's doing in a lot of different ways. I can't think of a lot of current politicians now that have that ability to just instantly excite a crowd and connect with them. I think uh, Jack Kennedy had that, and he's got that ability. I think that he's tremendously appealing. He's not boring and gray. He's totally fascinating. His whole persona is just fabulous to behold. And uh, to have a character in politics again is a treat. At the end of World War II, America was a nation flush with triumph and prosperity. The economy was booming. Veterans had money to spend, and oh, there was plenty to buy. Men returned from the war to faithful girlfriends and married them. And across the country, entire communities were being built to accommodate the baby boom. George and Bernice Janos were part of this jubilant prosperity. The grandson of Czechoslovakian immigrants George Janos was a handsome, powerfully built man who'd left the coal mines of Pennsylvania before settling in Minneapolis. He'd earned seven battle stars for combat during the war, but he was a modest man and he never discussed his war record. His focus was on family and on work. Uh, he never wanted to be much more than what he was. He was a, uh, worked for the city of Minneapolis as a street laborer, and he was perfectly happy doing that. Bernice hailed from Iowa, and like many Americans of the time, her outlook was shaped by the Great Depression. She knew the struggle of hard times. Her father used to travel around when the Depression came, and uh, I believe there were eight or nine or ten children, and my, um, my mother-in-law, Bernice, fed them oatmeal every day. That was about all they could afford, and she took care of all those kids all by herself. Bernice had put herself through college to become a nurse. She served as a lieutenant in North Africa during the war, and in 1945 met George Janos back in Minneapolis. After a year-long courtship, they were married and bought their first home in a development on the south side of the city. And it was here their second son, James, was born on the 15th of July, 1951. The Janos home was always a lively one. George, a manual laborer with an eighth grade education, had opinions about everything. His father was fairly opinionated, uh, to put it nicely, when it came to politics. And I think there was a feeling, as a public servant, that he and the rest of the nation had been let down by politicians. He made it clear that politicians were corrupt, that it was almost the lowest form of life on earth to be a politician. George's youngest son, Jim, would one day take his father's view of politicians to heart. The two developed a strong bond, but Jim was devoted to his mother. Bernice 
Janos was a shrewd homemaker who made sure her family was well provided for. She was the one who handled the money, and she played the stock market, and she was good at it, all by herself. And she knew how to salt money away in the right kind of things and how to, t you know, juggle all of her accounts so that they always owned their cars. They never had to buy anything on credit. She was very big on that. Bernice was so concerned about money, she kept her job as a nurse even after she married. But no matter how busy she might have been, she always made time for her children. Bernice was a strict mother to her two sons. I mean, you, you could tell he, uh, you know, he was, he was raised well. You could tell he had rules that he had to live by. He arrived promptly uh, at the school. He was not absent really at all. Uh, he uh, was just very well mannered. Jim never missed school, but he wasn't much of a student. Sports was his passion, and he excelled. He excelled at football and baseball and wrestling. And in fact, Jim knew he wanted to be a wrestler, which was an odd goal for a little boy. You know, typically when you're in, in grade school, you, you get up on career day and tell people what you're going to do or what you want to do. And Jim got up there and said uh, he wanted to be a professional wrestler. And the teachers scolded him, said, Jim, that's a ridiculous idea, you know, go sit down, you know. Who would want to be a professional wrestler? But Jim wasn't a boy to give up a dream, a dream fueled by his admiration for his athletic brother, Jan. The two boys loved to listen to wrestling on the radio. In 1963, 12-year-old Jim started Sanford Junior High School. Since he had never done well at school, he was unsure of himself at first. I would describe Jim as somewhat introverted, believe it or not. Quiet, uh, soft-spoken. I don't recall him uh, leading class discussions. I don't recall him being the first to raise his hand to volunteer an answer uh, when the teacher asked a question. But he was absolutely in charge on the wrestling mat. At Sanford, Jim came alive when he wrestled. He and I were paired up many times. He uh, would uh, be very quick, very focused, very disciplined wrestler. He knew a lot of the holds. It wasn't but within 30 seconds, and suddenly I'd find myself pinned to the mat. So, in a sense, I guess I probably was one of Jim's first uh, wrestling uh, victories. Three years later, the now confident teenager started at Roosevelt High School. He was tall and lean with intense blue eyes. Jim was instantly recognizable. He looked very muscular, had very angular features, had short hair in style of the times. But the thing that really sticks out in some of those early photos is the chin. Jim used his body and his strength to become the best. He was a standout member of the football team, captain of the swim team, and in his senior year was voted the man with the best physique. Yeah, he always seemed to uh, have one of the prettiest girls in school, or he drove a GTO, and uh, yeah, he, he, I think he always wanted to be the best. My dad was just Mr. Popular. Everybody at Roosevelt knew my dad, partly because he was a little infamous and a little famous. He was a rowdy kid, you know, he, he told me about, you know, fun stuff they did, you know, messing around in high school, you know, <laughs> putting kids in lockers, things like that. You know, my dad was a little bit of a troublemaker in school. And at home, Jim loved a good argument, even with his father, on politics. They'd sit down around the kitchen tables at night, and they'd get in these huge, like, family discussions about it. And he'd be, you know, Grandpa would be shaking his fist, things like that, you know. He and his father used to debate politics and religion and everything you can imagine all the time. And when it would seem like they were at their worst with each other, were actually having the time of their life when they were debating. Life was good for Jim in these years. He graduated in 1969 and was planning to attend Northern Illinois University on a swimming scholarship. But America had other ideas. The Vietnam War was raging. The country was torn between those who supported the war and those who wanted to bring the soldiers home. On college campuses, military recruiters clashed with angry students and anti-war demonstrators. Several of Jim's friends talked of enlisting, but his plans didn't include going to war. Then one afternoon, he and a friend went down to the local Navy recruiting office. I wanted to go down and talk to the recruiter, and I wanted him to go down with me and, and uh, visit. And uh, he said, uh, 
Now, you remember, we're not going to enlist. I said, I know, I just want to go down and talk to him. And by the end of the afternoon, uh, Jim had enlisted in the Navy, had filled out the papers, taken the oath, gotten his military ID, and one of the things he was able to do with that ID was that night he went out and bought drinks. Jim decided to make the most of his impulsive decision to join the Navy. He'd always looked up to his older brother, Jan, who was serving in Vietnam as a Navy SEAL. So Jim decided that he, too, would join the elite sea, air, and land rescue team. It appealed to him in that it was a cut above the rest. In fact, a cut or two above the rest. It just not anybody could be a Navy SEAL. It appealed to him on an excitement level. He was a guy who craved excitement. Uh, and also, he had a very strong sense that if you were going to do anything, you might as well do it to the best of your ability. And if he was going to join the Navy, then by golly, he was going to be a SEAL. George Janos was disappointed. He hoped his son would go to college, but he supported Jim's decision. In September of 1969, 18-year-old Jim Janos left Minneapolis for California. The young man who had no intention of soldiering was about to start six months of training for one of the toughest units in the military. It would be like nothing he'd ever experienced before. In 1969, at the height of the Vietnam War, Jim Janos made a rash decision to join the Navy. That fall, he arrived in Coronado, California to begin training for the Navy's Sea, Air, and Land Rescue Unit, the SEALs. You will be exposed to pain and punishment for one reason and one reason only to make you the type of person we need to get the job done. During his six months of training, Jim was turned from a raw recruit to a full fledged commando. 18-year-old Jim was strong and self-confident by nature. Now, away from home for the first time, he was eager to prove himself. Jim had trained hard as a high school football player, a swimmer, and a wrestler. Still, the routine of a Navy SEAL demanded more of body and mind than anything his young life had prepared him for. The first month or so is, uh, is what we call preconditioning. And then about the fifth or sixth week, we have Hell Week is five days of hell, any way you want to describe it. And what it's designed to do is to, as closely as possible, emulate actual combat conditions. There are explosives going off around your head. You're, you're, denied, uh, you're denied sleep, uh, and you're denied uh, comfort. You're kept cold and miserable and wet. And Hell Week is what historically has separated the men from the boys. I think if you were to ask him today, he would probably admit that it was probably the most uh, physically and mentally challenging things he had ever done in his life. But he stuck with it. He joined the SEALs because they were the toughest unit in the Navy, and Jim had always wanted to test himself. In 1970, he completed his training and was stationed at Subic Bay in the Philippines, ready to start his service in Vietnam. At Subic, Jim stood out immediately. My first impressions were Here's a guy with a little bit of pizzazz. He uh, was a, a natural born leader, had a lot of charisma. He always had a little glimmer in his eye that made you wonder, what's he gonna do next? Put in the right direction, put on the right path, he would excel. Allowed to go too far the other way and he'd be the ma mafia don. It was the tough guy image Jim went for. He started lifting weights, gained 30 pounds, and then rounded out his look with a razor blade. I remember this with uh, crystal clarity his coming into quarters one morning with his head shaved. He uh, looked like a refugee from a horror movie with his, with his uh, Fu Manchu mustache and goatee. Jim would acquire more than a new look in the SEALs. He'd get a new name. His commanding officer wanted to distinguish between Jim and his brother Jan, who was also a SEAL. Jim made it easy. He neglected his uniform, showered infrequently. It earned him a nickname that stuck. Jim's nickname in the SEALs uh, was Janos the Dirty. He was different from his uh, really squared away brother in that he didn't spend a lot of time starching his uniform and polishing his boots. He clearly was something just a little bit different. But when Jim reached Vietnam, it was working as a unit that mattered. Men's lives depended on it. The work was dangerous and it was uncertain. The missions highly classified. 
When he deployed with his platoon to Vietnam, he would have gone out with the intent of doing grievous harm to, to, the, to the enemy. And he would have gone to set ambushes. He would have gone to extract villagers for intelligence purposes, for interrogation. He would have gone to blow up uh, enemy weapon stockpiles. During his years as a SEAL, Jim survived over 100 parachute jumps and dives up to 200 feet in shark-infested waters. He's never talked about those missions. When we came back to the States, May brought us in the, in the debriefing room, and we were given direct order to talk about nothing for the safety of the military, for the safety of us as individuals, and I honor that order. There were other reasons, too. He doesn't want to glorify the experience, and that's something I think that was hammered home to him by his father, uh, that it was a duty, it was something you did, and it wasn't something that you bragged about. The SEALs changed Jim Janos. He'd left Minnesota, an enthusiastic boy, came back from Vietnam, a man ready to endure anything. He left the SEALs, in my judgment, knowing that he could afford to think about things just a little bit more differently than, than, than the average bear. And, and I really think that it changed his life in many good ways and uh, gave him the motivation to attempt things no matter how hard they are, you know, and not to give up. Back home, Jim had a tough time conforming to civilian life. With no particular plans for the future, he roamed around Southern California. He rode with a motorcycle gang for a while and made a name for himself as a man who could provide protection for the right price. An old high school friend joined him out west, and the two became roommates. And his friend discovered that Jim was still Janos the Dirty. And I just moved in, and uh, I found an empty uh, spot on the floor where there weren't any uh, Harley-Davidson motorcycle parts. But usually there was, you know, uh, oil pans and chains and, uh, and frames everywhere in the house. After four years knocking around California, Jim tired of the biker lifestyle. In 1974, the 23-year-old went back to Minneapolis, where he enrolled at North Hennepin Community College. He was unremarkable in class and unforgettable on the football field. He was a scary football player. You know, he'd put on the pad and helmet, and he'd have like a big thing of chew in his mouth and his long hair kind of hanging out the back, just real scary-looking defensive men. When he showed up for football practice in the, in the summer of 74, he wore the blue bandana that, uh, you know, Deion Sanders has made famous. And uh, when he'd make a quarterback sack, I remember he'd take his helmet off and wave it in the air and kind of dance back to the huddle. Jim was old for a college freshman, and his experience in the Navy had been a life-and-death struggle. Now football seemed almost childish. Restless, he spent his days working out at a local gym where his focus, concentration, and physique got him noticed. He knew he wanted to do something, but he really wasn't sure what it was. And he was approached by a former wrestler who said, you would be really good at this. And um, he started training, and he felt that, yeah, I have the physical ability, and I definitely have the mental ability. And he thought it would be a way to uh, uh, just try something totally different in his life. It made sense. Jim hadn't forgotten his childhood dream of becoming a wrestler. He kept on pumping up and paying attention to what professional wrestlers were doing. He found inspiration in one of wrestling's greats. I bought the front row ticket and I went inside and sat down and out came superstar Billy Graham. And I had been pumping iron now for about a year. So I was starting to get buffed and starting to get big. But this guy was beyond belief. You know, he had 22 and a half inch arms. He had bleached blonde hair. He got in the ring and posed and my mind was set at that point. I wanted to do what the superstar did. And, yeah, he was my hero. Wrestling was Jim's goal and there was only one way to get there. He now worked out with professional wrestlers and pumped up to a 56 inch chest and 21 inch arms. When he wasn't training, Jim worked as a bouncer at a local bar known for its rough crowd. One night, an attractive young woman walked in, and the brawny Jim was swept off his feet. He asked the petite Teresa Larson out on a memorable first date. And I bought all these new clothes, and I was so excited because he told me he was going to take me to the yacht club. 
The yacht club turns out to be a hangout called The Schooner. It was a bar in South Minneapolis where he and all his buddies went, and you could spit tobacco on the floor, <laughs> and there was brawls. The first night I was there, the police went out and drugged some guy off of his girlfriend that he was beating the tar out of, and I was just sitting there with my mouth open going, who are these people? <laughs> Some women might have been intimidated, but Terry saw something in Jim. He was charming, and if his manner was aggressive, there was also a tender side. When we were alone together, he was very quiet and, and very um, gallant and very peaceful within himself. The courtship was short and sweet. Both of them knew this was love. Within nine months, Jim proposed, and they married in a tiny church outside of Minneapolis on a hot July day in 1975. The wedding had an eccentric charm all its own. We had this little three-piece band that knew Proud Mary and three polkas, because that's all we could afford. And uh, their toupees kept sliding off of their foreheads and down over their eyebrows. And the camera, the photographer who took our pictures had a heart attack. So it was quite an interesting wedding. <laughs> In 1975, with $200 in his pocket, Jim Janos and his new bride, Terry, moved to Kansas City, Missouri. Wrestling was wildly popular there, and Jim hoped he could start a professional career. A friend of mine in Minneapolis had had a gym, Eddie Sharkey, called me the telephone. He said, I have a prospect. He said, the kid's been training pretty hard for a year, a year and a half, and I think he has some talent. After watching his first match, Bob Geigel was convinced the kid did have talent. It looked like Jim Starr would rise in the world of wrestling. And he looked at me and he said, kid, he said, stick it out in this business. He said, someday you're going to make a lot of money. And uh, he knew. He had the eye. He knew. And I knew. But talent was only half the battle in the ring. Professional wrestling is, after all, one part sport, one part theater. Performance and image are paramount. Jim needed a persona, a character that would become his new identity. So the Minnesota-born Jim Janos became a California surfer dude named Jesse Ventura. Jesse, because Jim liked the name, and Ventura plucked from a map of California. Jesse Ventura, dressed in colorful tights, was a long way from a Navy SEAL, but he had a heavy dose of Jim's self-confidence. Wrestling is made up of good guys and bad guys. Jesse Ventura was a bad guy that fans love to hate. His popularity with crowds made him a favorite of promoters. You don't have to be a great wrestler to make a lot of money in wrestling or be a great wrestling star. You know, you, you have to have the ability to sell yourself, and, and he was very good at that. Once he established a name for himself in places like Kansas City and Portland, Oregon, Jesse moved back to Minneapolis where he and Terry started a family. In 1979, Terry gave birth to their first child, a son they named Tyrell. Jesse stood six foot five, weighed 270 pounds, but he was easily overwhelmed by his newborn son. I was the first to hold him in the world, and he looked up at me and smiled. And I'll never forget that. I mean, when you got him in the palm of your hand like that, and he looks up at you and smiles. But Jesse's budding career often kept him away from home. Wrestling means a life on the road. Ventura fought up to 15 times a month, sometimes logging 2,000 miles a week, traveling to matches. For some wrestlers, time on the road was a welcomed opportunity to party. But bad boy Jesse had left his partying days behind. After every match, he went back to his hotel room and called Terry. He tried really hard not to get trapped by that li lifestyle of on the road with the guys. He tried really hard to keep in perspective his popularity and um, all the things that could happen to someone who's on the road all the time. And I always knew what hotel he was in. I always knew if I called, he'd be there. You're away from home a lot. But then again, it's good, too, because you, you, when you're away a lot, when you do get home, you don't like to fight. You know, you, you want quality time with each other. In many ways, Ventura's traveling strengthened his marriage. The time that he and Terry did spend together became that much more valuable to both of them. When he was home, it made everything like a party all the time. Oh, you know, his dad's home, you know, Jesse's home. We'd, we'd never had, we never had time to fight or argue over things because we were always so happy to see each other. The man with the 
with the fantastic body, Jesse Ventura. Jesse hit his stride in the Minneapolis-based AWA, the American Wrestling Association. One thing that distinguished him from the other wrestlers was his muscular physique. His build prompted one Minnesota promoter to dub him The Body. Jesse The Body Ventura, 262 San Diego. And when The Body teamed up with Adrian Golden Boy Adonis, the newly formed tag team found their niche. Ventura and Adonis were the AWA's bad guys. They were a well-matched team. And Adonis works over Rogers. Adonis was considered a great wrestler. Jesse was not. He had a limited repertoire of moves, wasn't as agile as the other wrestlers. But Ventura excelled at performing for the crowd. When he swaggered into the ring, wrestling fans booed and cursed. His presence on a wrestling card would sell out at arena. He wore a lot of glittery stuff and a lot of, you know, tie-dye, tie-dye long pants. And, you know, he would, he would flex, you know, his, he would flex his biceps and do, do bodybuilding poses. I'll never forget when the first time I sold out the St. Paul Civic Center and I walked in the ring and I started my strut as I went with my bleach blonde hair and I threw it back and the crowd, 19,000 of them were chanting, Jesse sucks in unison. And I turned to them and I kissed like that told them where they could go or what they could do but to have them in the palm of your hand and control them emotionally like that is a powerful feeling and it's a power of performing and as for you crusher we're gonna finish off the legend from milwaukee jack jesse was charismatic outside the ring as well articulate and witty his skill at interviews set him apart from the other wrestlers in the ring jesse probably wasn't the greatest uh a guy to ever put on a pair of boots and tights and come down the pike. But as a communicator, as somebody that could get out and lay his spiel out on the air uh, during these interviews, these promos that we uh, that we cut, uh, Jesse was the best. During the early 80s, wrestling's popularity grew wildly. By 1982, Jesse, Vietnam veteran and college dropout, was earning $100,000 a year. In 1984, Ventura left the familiar AWA for the larger World Wrestling Federation, the WWF, which promised national exposure and greater fame. At age 33, Jesse Ventura had been wrestling professionally for nine years. And despite the acting involved in professional wrestling, some blows do connect. Ventura had suffered a number of injuries. He was in pain every single day. In the summer of 1984, Jesse began to experience more than just routine aches and pains. He called Terry several times from the road, complaining of fatigue. He didn't have stamina. He was often short of breath. The day before a scheduled match with Ventura's arch rival, Hulk Hogan, the phone rang once more at the Ventura home. I got a phone call from a doctor, and he said, you have to fly, you have to get on the next plane, and you have to come to San Diego. And I said, well, why? And he says, I, I really don't want to talk about it a lot on the phone, but your husband's condition is very critical. Jesse had developed blood clots in his lungs. He was in the hospital in a great deal of pain and at great risk. If one of the clots flowed to his brain or to his heart, he could die. I sat right by his side, except at night when he would fall asleep, I'd go back to my hotel room and just call my mom and cry because he was so big and I'd never seen him helpless in all the time that I was married to him. It was very frightening. After a tense few days, doctors were able to dissolve the blood clots and Ventura was released from the hospital. But the life-threatening experience made him question his future. He was 33 years old. He'd been wrestling since he was 24. He'd worked hard at becoming Jesse the Body Ventura and he'd made a good living at it, earning as much as $350,000 a year. But was it worth his life? And if he couldn't wrestle, what would he do? Biographies look at Jesse Ventura will continue. But first, Biofeedback asks, which wrestler should Jesse choose as his running mate if he runs for the presidency? Log on to our Body Slam feature at biography.com and tell us what you think. I'll tell you, when Jesse the Body puts a hold on you... By 1985, Jesse Ventura had been taking blows to the body for nine years. 
He'd been hospitalized, treated for blood clots in his lungs, and now he was wondering if the sport was worth the health risks. In 1983, he and Terry had had a second child, a daughter, Jade. Ventura decided he would take no more chances. As much as he loved wrestling, it was time to give it up. During his slow recovery, Jesse had begun working as a television color commentator for the World Wrestling Federation. The job suited Ventura perfectly. He could still mouth off in front of a camera, but he would never again be body slammed by a fellow wrestler. He soon left the WWF to become a commentator with World Championship Wrestling, a rival league. I'm Jesse, the Jesse was the first sportscaster to side with the bad guys. His outrageous announcing gained him more notoriety than he'd had as a wrestler. Suddenly, he had a whole new assortment of fans. Ventura was noticed for his new celebrity and for his theatrics. You didn't have any idea who I was, did ya? Before long, he was recruited for small roles in movies, including a part opposite Arnold Schwarzenegger in the 1987 film Predator. You're hit. You're bleeding, man. I ain't got time to bleed. By the late 80s, Jesse was pulled into yet another, even more surprising arena, politics. He and his family lived in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota, where Jesse was going head to head with the city council over the town's plans to develop a wetlands area. Jesse wasn't happy with the way local politicians responded to his concerns. And at some of the meetings, they were so rude that Jesse finally just looked at them and said, you're gonna make me run for mayor, aren't you? Because the mayor election was coming up. And they laughed at him and they said, you can't win. I got angry and was told I couldn't do it. And you don't tell a frog, man, he can't do something, especially this one. And now uh, that did it. The council members should have taken him seriously. Jesse ran an effective campaign. In one night, volunteers blanketed the town with campaign flyers. Jesse was a newcomer to politics, but he had name recognition. In spite of his political inexperience, he won the 1990 mayoral election by a landslide. But being mayor of Brooklyn Park was a part-time job, and Ventura's power to make changes was limited. He needed a majority to get new measures passed, not likely in a system where he was an outsider. He ran up against a firmly entrenched political group that had been in power for over 18 years. They'd been unchallenged before. Um, this was somebody new coming in, shaking up the system, changing the way things had been done for a long time, and they really couldn't accept that. You don't know my personal situation. Don't interrupt me. Some council members complained that Ventura was rude and intimidating, and that his television and movie-making schedule interfered with council business. And in fact, Jesse did miss a number of sessions. In spite of his popularity with voters, Ventura did not seek a second term. In 1994, the Venturas moved to a 32-acre horse ranch in Maple Grove, Minnesota. The following year, Jesse was asked to host a radio talk show. Being back in front of a microphone was like going home to Ventura. See, I used to ride with the largest outlaw motorcycle club in Southern California. On the air, he was loud, he was opinionated, uh, he was everything you would expect of Jesse the Body Ventura. Ventura's radio show gave him a forum to speak out on issues he was passionate about, especially the idea that government shouldn't meddle in people's affairs. He often backed third-party efforts like Ross Perot's Reform Party. In 1996, Ventura co-chaired the campaign of Reform Party Senate candidate Dean Barkley, but in public appearances together, Jesse got all the attention. I said, Jesse, the wrong person's running. This should be you. And I told him at that time, your turn is next. He laughed at me at that point in time, but that's when the light bulb went on in my head that we had someone here that had a unique ability to connect to people that very well could turn into a great statewide candidate. By 1997, Barkley and his team were calling Ventura every two weeks, trying to coax him to run for governor. Jesse didn't say yes, but he didn't say no either. Finally, in September of that year, Ventura asked Barkley to come out to the ranch. He wanted to talk. And I told him what it would be like to run for statewide office, the kind of sacrifices it was going to be. And he listened to that, and he says, well, I think I want to give it a try. 
And he told me, well, this was the easy sell. Now we have to go out to the horse barn and convince my wife, Terry, to let me do it. She's not a, a public person like I am as much, but I think she knew I had the need. She knows when I get focused and have to do something, and she always looks at me and goes, you are the warrior. Jesse promised Terry that she and the kids would not have to go out on the campaign trail and that the children would be kept out of the spotlight. He made quite a different pledge to the eager members of his campaign staff. He said there's one rule and one rule only that I'm going to make sure that everyone abides by is that this is going to be fun. And if we stop having fun, I'm withdrawing from the race and I'm out of this because politics doesn't have to be boring. On January 27th, 1998, Jesse Ventura officially threw his hat into the ring. The governor's race was on. Let the fun begin. All right, all right. You are watching Jesse the Body Ventura, part of Body Slam Week, on Biography Slam Week, on Biography. By February of 1998, Jesse Ventura had become an official candidate for governor of Minnesota but nobody took much notice. He ran on Ross Perot's Reform Party ticket, though he was never endorsed by Perot. Ventura was a third-party candidate with little chance of raising money for his campaign, and he was running against two respected politicians, Republican Norm Coleman, the mayor of St. Paul, and a Democrat from Minnesota's favorite political family, Attorney General Hubert Humphrey III. What chance did Jesse have? Even uh, right up to the election, it was considered a joke. The notion that the good folk of Minnesota would uh, reject Hubert Humphrey's son and a substantial Republican and put in Jesse the body uh, was not something that occurred to any of us would actually happen. But what the pundits didn't see was Jesse's ease with the people. As the pre-election summer rolled on, Ventura's campaign gained grassroots support. Looks like another good day at the fair. At the annual Minnesota State Fair, the Jesse Ventura booth drew hundreds of people a day. Oh, I don't care if a bill is Democrat or Republican. If it's good for Minnesota, I'll sign it. If it's bad, I'll veto it. Jesse's appearance at the State Fair was perfect for him. It put him squarely in his element. He is very good with people. He is very good with crowds. And it became kind of a turning point for him. I don't believe in politics. I believe in results. His slogan was, retaliate in 98. Retaliate against partisan politics and politicians who were out of touch with what voters wanted. Minnesotans knew Jesse the Body as the former wrestler and the radio shock jock who always had something to say. Now they began to really listen to him. He was opposed to new taxes. I will veto any new tax that comes on my desk. There's not an excuse they can give me for it. Against government involvement in people's private lives. You a Harley rider? You bet. I will tell you this, with me as governor, rest assured, I'll veto any helmet law. That's your option. And though he'd renamed himself Jesse the Mind, Ventura still had plenty of his old charm and humor. I make my living with my mind now instead of my body. So I'm Jesse the Mind. Does that come as a, kind of a disappointment to some of your fans who come up here? I don't think so, because I still got 18-inch pipes. <laughs> oh, we're ready to get started with our first round of questions. Uh, but first, we're going to introduce the candidates. Not that they necessarily need it, but here they are. At the insistence of Democratic farm and labor candidate Hubert Humphrey, Ventura was included in all six gubernatorial debates. Like everyone, Humphrey assumed that Jesse had no chance of winning. What he hoped was that every vote Ventura won would be a vote Republican Coleman lost. But Ventura owned the debates. If a business succeeds or fails out in the free marketplace, you can't go looking to government to bail them all out. Because then how do you pick and choose? Jesse was economically conservative, but socially liberal. He supported both gay rights and abortion rights. Ventura presented himself as someone simply telling it how he saw it. I'm the only candidate that spent his entire career literally working in the private sector. Even while I was mayor, I was required to hold a full-time job in the private sector. My two opponents, they've been cashing government checks for well over 20 years. Okay, speaking of... Uh, uh, speaking... Like oh, whoa, 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 whoa. He was so different in the debates, and that was the forum in which you could see the three of them side by side, and you had the, the DFL candidate and the Republican candidate 
candidate attacking one another. And Jesse being Jesse, just every day guy, I'm one of you. What's up with these two bozos? <laughs> Jesse moved up in the polls. Now he was a real factor in the race. The media pressed him on fiscal and social issues. But Cor Ventura supporters didn't seem concerned about the specifics of his plans. All right, all right. How you doing today? There were constantly articles in the newspaper that would lay out the three candidates and where they stood on the issues. And next to Jesse's name on issue after issue, it would say no plan, no plan, no plan. But the ironic thing is the people didn't seem to care. Ventura's final campaign ad, The Thinker, cast the candidate in a whole new light. A man who will fight to return Minnesota's budget surplus to the taxpayers. As he promised his workers, Jesse's campaign was fun. But every political campaign has its downside. It was like the old days in wrestling. Jesse was on the road constantly, not able to spend much time with his family. It took a lot of pressure, you know, he was very much, you know, very slowed down and tired at the end of the day. But at the same time, you know, there was always that twinkle in his eye that he knew what he was doing was good. And that really kept him going. Jesse Ventura ended his campaign with a 72-hour RV tour of the state. He shook hands with his fellow Minnesotans, slept little, and closed in on the other candidates in the polls. Just days before the election, Ventura was only two or three points behind. It was a neck and neck race. Let's go vote. Let's go vote. On election day, November 3rd, 1998, 61% of Minnesota citizens turned out to vote. Extraordinary for a midterm election. Jesse carried every age group under 60. Ventura voters included his supporters and protest voters, people who were simply tired of politics as usual. What is so gratifying about this? is being able to prove the experts wrong. That night, even as the numbers rolled in, the old guard couldn't believe what was happening. And they kept saying, oh, this is not real, don't worry, you know, X precinct will come in, or Y district, you know, and it's all gonna turn around later in the evening. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> it didn't. And by 10 o'clock that night, Jesse Ventura was declared governor-elect of Minnesota. The final tally gave him 37% of the vote. Not a mandate, but a clean victory. And even Ventura seemed taken by surprise. It started sinking in, and I think Jesse then started realizing he was gonna be governor, and you could just see his thought process going, now what am I gonna say? You know, I have to go out there and actually now be governor-elect. Jesse had always relished his role as an outsider. Now he would have to learn to work within the system that he'd scorned during the election. Minnesota and America would be watching. The advantage is that uh, he will be able to do things with a certain flair and, and uh, maybe get the people behind him, go over the heads of the legislature to the people. The disadvantage is everybody's going to be watching everything he does from the very beginning. And when you are a novice, that's tough. I simply will say I will do the best job I'm capable of doing, and that's the promise that I've made to the people and the promise that I'll make to you. I think Jesse faces the challenge that he really does have to lead, and that all those details that he couldn't bother himself with during the election are now very real, and they're a real part of, of governing. And can you rectify this outsider image with the day-to-day duties of, of governing a state. Can you still be an outsider? Can you still be true to that sort of image and accomplish what you need to as governor? But from his days as a Navy SEAL to his success as a wrestler in pink tights to an unexpected win in the governor's race, Jesse Ventura had proved himself able to rise to a challenge. He had so much drive and so much energy and so much natural smarts, just native intelligence, that he was bound to wind up being somebody. I think the sky's the limit. Jesse, 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 Jesse. Last month, Governor Ventura said he might consider running for the presidency if Minnesotans gave him their blessing, then ruled it out the very next day. He also generated headlines when he called organized religion a haven for the weak. So Governor Ventura has taken a pledge to stop being quite so reckless with his personal opinions. 
In a lifetime filled with challenges for Jesse Ventura, keeping quiet may be the greatest one of all. Tomorrow, the biggest man in wrestling, Andre the Giant, picked up his board and carried it from small arenas to huge stadiums. The Giants, when Body Slam Week continues, cried it. And next up on A&E, stay with us for the unreal story of professional wrestling. From the Monster Factory in New Jersey, I'm Harry Smith. I'll see you then. Search A&E's award-winning Who's Who database, Biography.com, with over 20,000 lives at your fingertips. Biography.com is the online authority for every life story. Who will you meet today? Now, it's the unreal story of professional wrestling on Investigative Reports, next on A&E. For the web...